Okay. 501 on uh, December 16th, so I'll call the Health and Human Services Board to order. Uh, roll call. Colleen, please. Kathy Leaf. Present. Kara Koch. Present. Dave Osnes. Present. Scott Yard. Present. Greg Telejohn. Present. Paulette Anderson. Present. Deb Lindemann. Present. Natasha Ward. Present. Paul McGinnis. Present. Very good. We've got everybody here today. Thank you all. Uh, everybody has had a chance to look at the minutes from November 18th. Are there any additions or corrections? Seeing none, those will stand as written. Uh, at this point, we're going to take some public comment. Uh, Ken, I don't know how many folks we've got online, uh, but we're not going to go any longer than an hour maximum. So let's bring the first one up, Ken. All right. I have 18 attendees online, and I have um, about seven or eight hands raised right now. So we're going to go with Becca first. And then Adam is going to be my timer. Um, can you hear me? We can hear you, Becca. Go ahead. Um, my name is Becca Hagel. I live in Hudson. Um, I just want to share a COVID story. Um, I have an elderly aunt that lives in Hudson. She has cancer. Uh, she rarely leaves the house. And when she does, it's to go see her oncologist. Although she's been extremely careful, one of her children who run errands for her was not and they were COVID positive, but asymptomatic. Because of this, she contracted the virus. She was severely ill, bad cough, labored breathing, body aches, fever. We weren't sure she would make it. Uh, somehow, through the grace of God, she did, but she still isn't the same. Um, I'm urging this board to provide more education um, it's not going to reach the extremists in our communities, uh, but it may reach some that, um, that just don't know some of these things. Um, I'd also like to see more transparency in your reporting. Where are these outbreaks happening? What city is, I would like to see the numbers, um, done by city. Um, and I'd also like this board to um, bring to the county board um, a compromise on 25% capacity um, and maybe see it to be 50% capacity because that would be better than the 125% capacity we're currently seeing. Um, and that's all I have to say. Okay, next up we have Nancy Christian, Christensen, sorry. Hi, my name is Nancy Christensen and I live in downtown um, Hudson. Um, I would really like to support our um, local restaurants, but at this time they are at a maximum of about 125% and no masks are being worn within these restaurants. Um, I was wondering if you could present to the board of a 50% capacity within the restaurants and the other businesses. Um, I really would like to support our community and our businesses and keep them open, but I can't even walk downtown on the weekends anymore because of how many people are, are in our town um, without masks because there's no mask mandate. And when you go on social media, you see pictures of packed bars. Um, my city is really unhealthy right now, and I would really, really appreciate it if there could be some kind of mandate followed or some kind of ordinance so that people are required to wear masks in a, um, in a business, in a public or in any of the businesses in, in um, Hudson. Thank you very much. Thank you, Nancy. All right. Uh, and remember, for any of the uh, the new attendees that have arrived, if you use the raise hand feature to get into the uh, the queue for public comment, uh, the chairman has said that public comment will be limited to one hour this evening. Next up is Susan Van Meel. Oh, 
Okay. Can you hear me? Yes, go ahead. Okay. It's Suzanne Van Mealy, and I am from the town of Troy. Um, I would like to see you take another crack at an ordinance that's similar to what we have, what they have in Pierce County, where they've given authority to their health officer, and they also have enforcement ability because um, what happens is that when when there's a, a violation of their ordinance, what they do is they give a, a business or individual a certain amount of time to comply. And if they don't, it's $500 a day. And that citation is issued either by the health officer or the sheriff's office. Now, if you limit it to that, where you're not, you know, pulling people off the street for not wearing a mask and the, that sort of thing, you could manage that by, I'm sure you have um, your, you know, the, the county serves citations and um, there wouldn't be very many if you had a hefty fine. And there, from what I understand, they haven't issued fine number one down there for $500 a day in, when they don't follow the rules. And also I'd like to make it uh, clear that on July 28th is when the Pierce County um, ordinance went into effect. And I know that at the town or at the town board or the county board meeting that um, that was stated to be a lot earlier, which isn't true. Also, um, I took the uh, current cases in Pierce and compared them to their population. And um, it's their active cases for the last seven days. I don't know how we calculate it here, but I think I think it's more than seven days. If you made it 14 days, you have one out of 83 persons here that are, are in Pierce County that um, are walking around with, or could be out in public, uh, act with a confirmed active case as a, and spreading it. Um, and in, in our county, it's one in 38. You know, it seems to me that they Five have minutes. two minutes. Okay. Thank you, Suzanne. <coughs> All right, up next we have Hello Hudson. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, if you could just state your name for us. Yes, my name is Renee and I am from Hudson, Wisconsin. And I would just like to say that um, I think that you guys should look at um, bringing um, free testing sites to Hudson because we have the most cases, active cases in the community, in the county, and there has not been a single free testing site um, available and it costs $300 for us to be tested in Hudson if we don't have insurance. So I think that's where you should go with that. Thank you. All right, thank you, Renee. All right. Uh, next up, we have uh, Kelsey Janetsky. Go ahead, go ahead Kelsey. Thank you. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Awesome. My name is Kelsey Janetsky. I live in downtown Hudson, Wisconsin. Um, I'm also requesting that you mandate a 50% occupancy restriction on all bars and restaurants in the county. Um, I'm asking for this until Minnesota also opens to 50% for their bars and restaurants. I'm also asking that you publish more information on where outbreaks are occurring so that citizens of our county can make more informed decisions. I believe that this is a fair compromise between business impact and public safety. Um, everyone in our county deserves to feel safe and welcome in bars and restaurants, not just the people who aren't worried about COVID-19. As a resident of Hudson, I've seen the effects of overfilling bars and restaurants um, with both COVID and public safety. We saw the tragic death of a Minnesota resident recently, and our police chief spoke about the overwhelm of his force. Citizens can't enjoy the community we love dearly, and the restrictions that our city of Hudson put recently in place have ramifications on the surrounding communities. So I think the county has an opportunity to make a difference and protect all of its citizens. So that's why I'm asking for an enforceable 50% occupancy restriction and more information about where outbreaks are occurring. Thank you. All right, thank you, Kelsey. Uh, 
Up next is Sarah Yaku. Go ahead, Sarah. Thank you uh, to the board and for giving the public an opportunity to speak. My name is Sarah Yacoub. I'm a resident of Hudson. I am also asking that the board take another crack at the ordinance. Uh, we heard from another of board members talking about letting people do the right thing. Uh, Paul Burning said some nice words and then he went out and partied at the bars uh, thereafter in celebration. People are not doing the right thing. Uh, the bars are packed as you all know or should know and it's short-sighted. We're talking about liability to the city. We're talking about liability to taxpayers, increased police costs, liability to business owners. You know, we are the hub for drunken debauchery because we're surrounded by places that have decided to be more responsible. So everyone who is irresponsible is flooding here because it's a free for all. And that is gonna keep rising, uh, raising costs for us as taxpayers. And again, increasing liability. Um, if you all have an opportunity to take a look at something called game theory, when you're dealing with bullies, there's no set of words that you say in the right tone that makes them cooperate. They're not going to cooperate until they have to. So I'm asking you as local leaders to stop cowering to the loudest irrational group among us. You are entrusted to lead and to figure out what is a rational response to a pandemic and what is an irrational response. And right now I'm watching our county cower to irrational responses. Thank you. All right, thank you, Sarah. Up next is the Collins family. Okay. Okay. Can you hear me now? We can, go ahead. Oh, beautiful. Uh, my name is actually Talia Tajima, but we do have a Collins in our family as well. I live here in Hudson, Wisconsin. And I am coming to speak to you today to express my support of our public health officials in establishing actionable and enforceable mandates to stem the COVID-19. Um, as of 12:15 on our St. Croix County dashboard, there are 22 people dead and 31 hospitalized. Unfortunately, as a community, we have miserably failed in our duty to protect our fellow citizens. We've had an opportunity to stand up and do what's right, but it's been shown time and again, people are choosing not to do so. Um, Benjamin Franklin, one of our founding fathers, whose words I'm sure we've all often heard being woefully misquoted and misapplied in supposed defense of my quote-unquote rights, wrote a letter in 1773 to Dr. Benjamin Rush stating in part that he had observed people who had often caught cold from one another when shut up together in closed rooms, coaches, etc., and when sitting near and conversing so as to breathe in each other's transpiration. Because of this, our founding father encouraged quarantining those sick or who had potentially, or who had potential of carrying illness to stop spread. Franklin was a man who was one who would study the data and seek public health. After living through an outbreak of smallpox, the pandemic of their own time in Washington's time, and after losing his own four-year-old son in 1736 to said disease, he had stated, "I long regretted bitterly and still regret that I had not given." the inoculation to him by inoculation. This I mentioned for the sake of parents who admit the operation on the supposition that they should never forgive themselves if a child died. George Washington also separated and quarantined his own soldiers and those near them at the potential risk of reduced troops to protect his own people. With that being said, I would like to see an ordinance in place that could reduce business, um, public bars and restaurants capacity to 50% to save the lives and stem transmission. I would also appreciate seeing some kind of notice to public of outbreaks occurring so that we as citizens can make an informed decisions on where we can safely purchase goods while reducing potential risk of exposure to ourselves. You will hear the voices of loud bullies who will use- Sorry, that's, two, that's two okay. minutes. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Up next, we have a Galaxy S9 device. Hi, Hi. it's Lynn Bensel here, sorry. Okay, I had to get out of the room, sorry about that. Um, I was wanting to inform the board and our county of an event coming up, which will be a um, coordinated with our administrator here, Ken Witt a listening session on Wednesday, December 30th from 6 to 8 p.m. 
This would include panelists such as a holistic nutritionist, two chiropractors, a pastor, a medical doctor, a lifestyle coach, and a mental health provider, all with the purpose of informing our citizenry of other things we can do to help stay safe, stay healthy, besides um, focusing on putting down heavy restrictions on our personal behaviors and fining um, and controlling, such as through the ordinance. Um, this would be a chance for the panelists to share their points of view for about 10 to 15 minutes each and would include a question and answer at the end. Um, it is in hope that we would be equipping our citizens with information that they may not hear anywhere else, help us as a community to come together instead of separate us. Have We have the same goal. We want to be healthy, we want to be strong, and we want to be positive, and we want to begin trusting each other again. And we look forward to um, working with this committee, and we appreciate the opportunity to have this listening session, and we hope to have some of this information shared on a flyer that will be sent out to the entire um, county the second week of January. And again, we hope that we, they will include some of the information that we share from this listening session. Um, thank you very much. Thank you, Lynn. And I think uh, Chair Osnes will talk a little bit about that under uh, future items or announcements, uh, what uh, that listening session entails. Um, the next public commenter we have is Moto G Stylus. So I get to say, hello, Moto. If you could please state your name for us. Me, this is Darla Myers. I'm speaking as a citizen and not a Town of St. Joseph supervisor. I just wanted to remind people what COVID-19 means. CO, coronavirus, common cold, VI, virus, D, disease, 19, 2019. This is a common cold virus. Unless you are God, you will not be able to get rid of this virus. And I also wanted to point out the hypocrisy of those who deflect and call others bullies. They are the very people that championed the all are welcome and never having any exceptions. And now I see them trying to exclude anyone they think might be a problem to their lifestyle. It doesn't work that way. Constitutional rights are constitutional rights. You can't be selective about which ones you choose or which ones you take away. Thank you. All right, thank you, Darla. I have uh, three more in the queue. Uh, up next is Kay Emerson. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, go ahead. This is Kristen Emerson from Hudson. Um, I just wanted to share a story. Uh, today I went into a local business, very uh, physically small business, the size of my bathroom. Um, I was paying and neither of the employees had a mask on and I had my mask on. So I was, you know, I was gonna pay and leave. And there was um, some issue that they were having behind the counter. And in the meantime, two more people came in, were invited in with no mask. And I was sitting there, one of five people. I had the only, I was the only one with the mask on and I felt very uncomfortable. I wanted to walk out. I was in the middle of a transaction, so I couldn't. Um, a second story I have is um, last week in New Richmond, Wisconsin, um, somebody I've known for decades died of COVID. Um, uh, she was an Richmond resident. She was my caregiver as a child. I've known her for a long time. Um, I noticed after she died, and it was of COVID, I noticed that the data dashboard wasn't updated, and I'm curious about that. Um, one of the things I'm asking for is some more transparency. Where are the COVID numbers happening? What city? 
Um, and what businesses? I want to know before I walk into a business if I'm going to be in the middle of four other unmasked people. I wouldn't have gone in. And that was really upsetting to me. Um, you know, there there is an end in sight now. There's a vaccine. And the last time this came to you guys, I was really disappointed. Um, I guess it wasn't you guys, but I was really disappointed with um, the county board and the failure to pass an ordinance, um, thinking that people are going to just do the right thing. I mean, I think we all knew before that was that that didn't pass, that people weren't going to do the right thing. And it's pretty clear now that they're not going to do the right thing. And I really think you need to revisit an ordinance with um, mask ordinance and a capacity ordinance because uh, these businesses are overflowing. You drive down the cities, you drive- Sorry, that's two minutes. Thank you. All right, up next we have Celeste. Go ahead, Celeste. Um, good afternoon. Uh, this is Celeste Cobrell. I live in the town of Hudson. Um, I would request that the Health and Human Services Board put together some guidance for towns in Hudson that are planning their January 2021 caucuses. Um, in the town, I know that there is federal, state, and local guidance that strictly advises that particularly anybody who's over 60 or has under any underlying health conditions or any disabilities should stay home, should not enter any space where there's anybody else who's not wearing a mask and doesn't keep distance, but basically should stay home. And that the county has guidance that says indoor gatherings should have no more than 10 people and that public gatherings of any size, everybody should wear a mask, maintain their distance. They should keep a list of everybody who's there. The seating should be fixed. There should um, be health screenings. And the towns are not planning to do any of that when they are planning to hold in-person caucuses. The town of Hudson in 2019 had between 75 and 100 people attend their caucus in person. I don't want to have to give up my voting rights because I have to choose to put my life and my husband's life at risk in order to go to a hundred person room where nobody's going to wear a mask. Well, I will. And people won't keep their distance. But I have to do that if I'm going to participate in the local electoral process for selecting the majority of candidate, the candidates for the majority of the seats on my town board in the April election. Somebody has to step up and do leadership here. Otherwise, our town caucus is gonna be a super spreader event. And people will have to choose between their constitutional rights to vote and their health and their lives. And that's wrong. Thank you. Thank you, Celeste. All right, up next we have Morgan Ritchie, and then I have three others on deck that have their hands raised. Uh, you do only have uh, one chance to speak this evening. Morgan, you are up. Hello, everyone. Um, my name is Morgan Ritchie, and I'm a resident of Hudson, Wisconsin. First off, I would like to thank you all for having this meeting and allowing public comment. Um, I believe that we have given our community a chance to be responsible and as we all have seen, that has not happened. And so I would very much like to urge you all to limit capacity to 50% for bars and restaurants. With the mask mandates um, or with the mask guidance, they're able to take off their masks for eating and drinking. And if a bar is full of people, then that just is another place for the virus to be spread. Um, I also request that data be made public so that I as a citizen can make intelligent and informed decisions about my safety and the safeties of others around me. Um, this is a serious issue as we all know, and I would just like to thank you all for being here for us and for doing your job to protect us citizens. Thank you. Thank you, Morgan. Lola is up next. Hi, this is Lola from Hammond, Wisconsin, and I would just like to ask you, do you always judge somebody that parks in a handicapped spot 
they don't limp, they don't look like they're handicapped, but they got a ha handicap sticker. Not all of us can wear a mask. Some of us have asthma and allergies and other problems where we cannot wear a mask. My question is, if you see that a place of business is completely full and it's not for you, then don't go in there. And if you're wearing your mask, why are you so worried if other people aren't? Aren't you protected? And our county, in nine months, we've lost 22 people with COVID. That's sad. But a majority of the people that have passed away have passed away after the voluntary mask mandate. So how is how can you attribute masks to saving lives? And again, if you are that scared, why are you going out? And why do you think you need to dictate to everybody else what they can and can't do? Don't look at me and judge me and criminalize me. Call me a murderer because I can't wear a mask. I take the personal responsibility. I will stay away from you. I will personally distance and I will not be up in your face. You will not catch anything from me. I am healthy. So don't put everybody in the same box and quit criminalizing some of us that can't help it. And it's just ridiculous to say, oh, you're a bully. You're a bully. You don't know my story. You don't know the story of someone getting out of a handicapped vehicle. And you look at them and think, well, they're not handicapped. Why do they have a sticker? How is that, how is that your concern? That's really rude. And, and oh, what about the no judging, no judging? This really isn't a one size fits all. And we really do have certain rights under HIPAA and et cetera and under um, the American Disability Act. And I really think that needs to be taken into consideration. Thank you. Thank you, Lola. Up next, we have Sarah Ligon. Go ahead, Sarah. Hello, thank you. Um, so unfortunately we're here again having this conversation and um, I feel that I need to remind you all yet again um, what you would be doing if you try and implement a mask mandate or limit capacity to 50% is that you will be attempting to deprive me of my rights under the color of law, uh, Title 18 U.S. Code Section 242, Deprivation of Rights Under of Color of Law, makes it a crime for a person acting under color of any law to willfully deprive a person of a right or privilege protected by the Constitution or laws of the United States. Um, if you proceed with acts of intimidation or coercion, you are putting your own financial security and liberty in jeopardy. Um, once you knowingly and willingly violate your oath, you forfeit judicial immunity and may be sued in your private and professional capacity. And um, if you trespass on my rights or my property, which my person, my body is my property, if you trespass on my rights without a warrant, I will hold each and every one of you accountable in your official and private capacity. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Uh, up next, we have Elise Moulter. Hi, my name is Elise Moulter. I live in uh, North Hudson. And I just want to say, I hope you guys keep spreading information, mm -hmm. spreading knowledge, spreading all those different things. But please do not overstep by taking away everyone's individual liberty and freedom. If, per, if a person wants to wear a mask, they can. If they don't, they don't. If someone wants to go out in public and go shopping, they can. If they do not, they, do, they don't have to. No one is making anybody do anything they want to do that is gonna make them uncomfortable. That is a choice. If you feel trapped at a store because you're in the checkout line, that is your choice. You can leave. No one is holding you there. Like you can leave at any point. This is a free country, and we already are limiting our businesses and everything in North or in, in the city of Hudson right now. When is it going to end? What what more and more and more needs to happen? Everyone's saying, "Oh, they're at 125 percent capacity." Where are they getting those numbers? 
also we're already restricting their Thursday through, you know, Saturdays now. When is this going to end? We're trying to do things to improve locally. It doesn't need to go bigger than that. If you do not feel comfortable in public, we've all been through this for over 10 months now. We understand COVID. Keep spreading new information as it keeps coming out, but let everybody make their own decisions. Please, please do your jobs by spreading information, but do not keep taking away our liberties and freedoms. Thank you. Thank you, Elise. Up next, we have Matt at Brookshaw. Hey guys, thanks for thanks for having me on. A um, couple things. Um, one, masks are not a cure. So, you know, if they are a method of reducing the spread and people want to wear them, go right ahead. Um, you know, no one's judging you for wearing one. Uh, secondly, there's several articles out there about vitamins, healthy living, different things like that, that can reduce your risk of infection. Or if you do get infected, the, the s symptoms can be less severe. Talk about that. You know, you guys are supposed to be leaders. Being leaders doesn't mean you dictate the people who voted you into office. It means... You provide everybody with the information, let them make their own decisions, and you go from there. So I'm against any ordinances, any mandates, restricting businesses, restricting rights. So thanks for your time. Thank you, Matt. Up next, we have Rick. Do you want to unmute and talk, Rick? All right. How's this? All right. Better. There you go. All right. Thank you. Uh, Rick Mannon. I'm from Wilson. And I just wanted to give you a quote by Ben Franklin. Whoever puts safety over freedom is not worthy of either. And 25% or 50% occupancy, occupancy uh, violates the commerce cause clause in the Constitution as well. So... Um, I've spoken before against the or any ordinance and um, just speaking for it again. Thank you for against it again. Thank you. All right. Nice and short. I like that, Rick. All right. Up next, we have Paul. That is Paul. I'm from uh, town of Troy. And uh, kind of concerns me. I heard earlier that uh, St. Croix County uh, board may be hosting an event that uh, could be spreading disinformation and inaccurate information that does not follow science. It doesn't sound like those people uh, were doctors of uh, epidemiology or uh, scientists that uh, specifically deal with viruses. Um, I think science has spoken. I think the doctors have spoken. And I believe every one of you received a letter from every major healthcare facility within St. Croix County urging you to do something in October, and you failed the citizens of St. Croix County. Uh, I sincerely hope that you are not going to host uh, an inaccurate information that is going to go out to the public, uh, which some people may buy into. Uh, not hosted by doctors. Um, I think you do need to spread knowledge. You do need to update the dashboard better. Uh, I believe the deaths on the dashboard do not reflect the deaths from St. Croix County residents that happen in Minnesota. And I'd like to see that uh, get accurate. Uh, and I believe uh, the masks, you got to understand the people that wear masks are preventing the other people from getting it not themselves. So you're keeping your, your droplets within the mask. And that's the whole idea. Masks are proven. It's not against people's rights. If it was, you'd see other states, counties, municipalities being sued. Uh, everybody around us, or many states within the United States right now, are doing the right thing. Wisconsin's not. St. Croix County's not. Uh, we do have an influx of people downtown, uh, which brings another health risk of St. Croix County. So at the end of the day, I hope you do the right thing. I hope you rethink this listening session. And it's uh, 
equal sided with doctors of epidemiology and uh, special doctors like uh, uh, the University of Minnesota doctors, maybe some Mayo Clinic I mean, doctors. And that's all I really have to say. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. All right. We have uh, Jess up next. Hi, this is Jessica Klatt from Hammond, Wisconsin. And I want to just give you guys a reminder as you head into this meeting that as of mid-November, according to the dashboard, um, we have had a dramatic decrease in daily daily cases. We were at 144 mid-November, right around November 11th, um, 144 for new cases per day. And as of today, it looks like we're at about 28. So we've had just a tremendous downward trend. And since we're so case focused, we really should be talking about that as being a big win um, since that's what we were focused on for so long. And then I also want to mention that we currently have a 99.56% uh, survival rate based on those cases that we do have confirmed in the County of St. Croix. That number is also increasing, which again is such a positive. So we have a higher survival rate. We have case numbers going down daily. Um, and since everybody was sharing their stories about COVID earlier, you know, I want to share mine. My grandfather just passed away. He was 92 years old. He had dementia. And I'm going to say he died of COVID. And I had to crawl in through his long-term care center window. I had to crawl in through his window to say goodbye to him. I hadn't talked to him face-to-face -face in 10 months, and all I wanted to do was hold his hand and tell him I loved him. So you tell me, as a board, if that's right, as he's dying, as he's taking his final breaths. So that's my sad story about COVID, and since you guys are also talking about COVID and mental health tonight, I'm really hoping that the damage is done to people by the tyranny being pushed upon them is talked about because I can tell you watching my grandpa die like that was horrible. And I know other people are going through similar things. So that's all I got. I just hope it becomes a topic of conversation since you guys are the leaders in our community. Thank you, Jess. All right, uh, Michelle, you are up next. Um, hi, this is Michelle Dennison from um, the town of Hudson. And I'd like to state, first of all, like uh, Jess stated, that COVID cases are going down. This is not an epidemic. Flu is uh, apparently non-existent this year. Um, are we going to panic every year when the flu returns? Uh, in case we did not know, in uh, 2018, there was a huge flu epidemic where in California, they set up tents outside hospitals to accommodate the overflow. Incidentally, the AMA, has retracted the station, the statement of opposition against hydroxychloroquine, we need to start prescribing that. More studies are showing that the PCR test is thawed and uh, as approximately as high as 97% of false positives. Um, I would also like to say that doctors are starting to report many cases of bacterial pneumonia because of the mask. Finally, I'm tired of the violations of the ADA Act, and I'm tired of the discrimination against people who are unable or choose not to wear masks. Thank you. All right, thank you, Michelle. All right, Kay Emerson, you've been very persistent, continuing to raise your hand. I'm gonna let you back in in case you have a second uh, speaker. Uh, but you don't get to have two public comments, just so you know. Um, Do you have a second speaker there? I uh, No, but I didn't finish. Please, can I just, uh, like, 30 seconds? No, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm afraid not. We're trying to keep everything equal. All right. All right. I do have one more now. Tamara Butler. Hello. Hello, oh, go ahead. Um, I, I just wanted to speak to the issue of um, not being able to uh, shop or feel safe in my own hometown, in my own county. Um, I really think it's important that the county board get ahead of 
the situation with the anti-vaxxers and, and the anti-maskers and, and use real science to keep the rest of us safe. And that's all I have to say. All right, thank you. Um, I do not have any additional hands raised in the lobby at this point. Till now. Just double checking my list. All right, Brandon is a new one. Go ahead, Brandon. Hey, Ken and County Board. Ken, you joked earlier that you uh, like the short public comment, so I'm going to leave a short one for you, okay? All righty. Don't tread on me. We will not comply. Stop. That's it. Think on that for a little bit. All right. That was a nice short one. Thank you, Brandon. Do we have any others uh, that need to make a public comment tonight? All right. I do not see any others. Uh, I'll turn the meeting back over to you, Chairman. Thank you, Ken. And with that, we're going to move right into our uh, business items. Uh, item number one is COVID updates, and we're going to hear from our public health staff and our nursing home uh, administrator. Kelly, do you and Ellie want to start us off? Sure thing. Um, I am joined by phone tonight, so this is going to be a little bit difficult for me. I'll wait till Ellie um, shares our presentation. She will be pulling it up. I have just a couple of slides related to what I anticipate there are a lot of questions in the community about. Um, I'll just wait. <laughs> Ken, can you go ahead and give me screen sharing abilities, please? There you go, Ellie. You should be able to now. Thank you. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Um, so, yeah, we wanted to just update you a little bit and thank you. Um, the board and administrator with for the extra support that we have received through our um, to our health department during the beginning or throughout this response. Uh, we are a small health department of under 17 staff pre pandemic and we have increased um, our FTEs exponentially. Um, I, I wanted to have all the numbers, but again, my computer crashed um, last night and I was unable to get that fixed today. Um, we have a variety of um, expertise and people coming in that we have trained um, to, to the best of our ability with limited resources, uh, related to um, just workforce training. Um, we had to come up with a lot of those things on our own. We do know the State Department of Health has also increased staffing capacity uh, and they are um, helping local health departments do contact tracing. Uh, we have been pretty um, fortunate that we have been able to handle most case, most of our cases and the influx of our cases with the state St. Croix County staff and the staff that we have um, brought on since the beginning of the response. Um, does anyone have questions related to staffing? Okay, next slide, Ellie. Okay, so vaccines. I heard a little bit about vaccines and public comment today. Um, I want want everyone to know that um, vaccines planning through um, this response started likely uh, probably a, roughly a month ago, and um, vaccine planning for the rollout of COVID has really generated 
at the federal level mandating states to have plans. And as locals, we have had plans since um, really before H1N1 happened in 2009. Um, we are health departments, public health preparedness specifically, um, have designed plans. Uh, we be say as St. Croix County Public Health, we are members of the Western Wisconsin Public Health Readiness Consortium, which focuses on public health emergencies, um, exercising and practicing for responses, uh, whether they're communicable disease related, whether they're natural disaster related, this is all role um, that, the, that we play in public health. Um, so vaccine planning, uh, what we know right now is that vaccine has been distributed in the state of Wisconsin um, to eight different hubs across the state. Two of those have um, publicly disclosed who they are. Um, so you may have seen that in the media. Uh, so these are hubs where vaccine is being shipped to from the um, state level to regional levels. Uh, we do have one in Northwest Wisconsin. It is undisclosed. Um, and when we ask the state, um, when we as local health officers ask the state about communication related to this, um, right now, I guess the state has been advised by Homeland Security not to share um, the different locations of the hubs um, because of uh, obviously security reasons. They do anticipate as more vaccine rolls into the state that um, those um, that will lessen and, and those hubs will become more public. So right now we have currently one vaccine that has been authorized um, and has been started um, has been has been given to healthcare workers. It is the Pfizer vaccine. Both of these vaccines, the one Pfizer and Moderna make, um, require um, cold storage. The Pfizer one is ultra cold storage and has to be uh, transported in a way which maintains um, super cold temperatures. And then once it is um, out of those cold temperatures, there we have a five-day window to, to get that vaccine into the arms of people. Um, so that's a little bit about Pfizer. I was on a national call last week where I heard probably some of the most informative information related to vaccine planning across the nation. Um, there were a lot of... Um, not absolutes. I think this is rapidly changing and things will change. And I know that can be frustrating for the public to um, grapple with and understand that this is changing for uh, us daily who are working in this day to day, um, just as fast as it is on all your, the different media and news outlets. So it, we, we, we would appreciate um, a little, um, well, the best way I've heard it stated was we all have to practice grace um, during this period because we know how fast and rapid this changes. So um, the Moderna vaccine will um, be discussed at um, the American, why can't I think of it, ASIP Council on Immunization Practices tomorrow. Um, so there won't be an ultimate decision tomorrow, but um, different groups who make decisions and uh, um, recommendations about who should get which vaccine and where it goes. That will happen tomorrow for Moderna. That happened uh, last week for the Pfizer vaccine. At the state level, we have um, our state disaster advisory medical team, which is making those um, recommendations on allocations and even prioritization within Group 1A. And if you go to the next slide, Ellie, we can talk a little bit about um, what phases um, and who falls into where. We, we don't have um, great answers to where all, all the different people who do want the vaccine, where 
like which 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 group do they belong to and when can they expect to get vaccine i think i need to um raise up um something that dr mcginnis had said i think um he had mentioned managing expectations related to the public's expectations as well as providers um is one of the key things through vaccine planning um, so hey, I know if you ask me, well, where I, my son is a police officer and where does he fit in, in this, um, in this picture, in this graphic <clears throat> and, um, likely we're making assumptions right now. And, um, you know, a potentially if we were to take the police officer as a scenario, we could say, well, he, he likely would fit into 1B somewhere. And where in 1B would that be? Well, we're waiting on more um, decisions and recommendations from that SDMAC, that State Disaster Medical Advisory Team to come out with those. And um, that some of those questions will be answered um, hopefully then. They do have a list of um, certain providers that you can uh, view on their website and we can send that definitely out with the minutes. I did not include it on this slide today as um, you heard about my technical difficulties. So um, I know there's likely questions about, well, what if we're in phase 1A and because it is important to know that this vaccine is a two dose vaccine, which means you get your first dose. And then depending on if it's Pfizer or the Moderna, there is a 21 day and 28 day um, wait in between the that and the second dose. And I'm sorry, my phone, my other phone is ringing. Um, so, th so there is a bit of lapse, and I know the the question is, well, can we start one B before one A happens? No, no, we can't. We can't do that, um, <laughs> and we'll wait for more recommendations um, from the state on what that looks like. I know there's probably a lot of questions. I can try to answer questions if the board has any. Um, I had a question, Kelly. Um, Supply of the vaccine, um, to your point about two doses, is is the chain going to keep be able to keep up? Supply chain. So yeah, that is a great question, and I think it's in the question of a lot of um, healthcare workers' minds as well. Um, so let me give you a little bit of raw numbers or numbers that we have been hearing at the local level. <clears throat> So in this first wave that the state of Wisconsin was allocated of the Pfizer vaccine, we got roughly 49,000 doses of this initial shipment. Um, the state of Wisconsin, DHS, estimates that we have 450,000 healthcare workers that would be eligible for vaccine in one in phase 1A. So that is... Um, you know, not even a quarter, right? The 49,000 isn't even a quarter of uh, the 450,000 people eligible. We do know that vaccine is continually is continuing to come into the state. I just don't have numbers on what that actually looks like. So I really can't say, yes, I'm confident that the supply chain will be able to keep up, but I do know um, that... Um, we are getting vaccine on a weekly basis in the state of Wisconsin. And I, I when we say weekly, um, I guess I should be careful with what I say. If it's weekly, is it daily? Is it every three days? I do not have that information. Thank you. And Kelly, can you clarify for the um, slide before this when you listed 49,000 doses of the Pfizer vaccine and 100,000 doses of the Moderna vaccine, is that for the entire state or is that for St. Croix County? Thank you so much. Um, that is for the entire state of Wisconsin and long-term care. Um, so, so I didn't talk about the long-term care program and the pharmacy program. So people are asking questions related to, well, what about, um, you know, the um, um, elderly population and the people in nursing homes? So they will not be vaccinated through um, 
healthcare workers, they are going to be vaccinated um, through a pharmacy partnership program. And all of our um, pharmacies in St. Croix County, or I'm sorry, all of our long-term care facilities in St. Croix County have um, been auto enrolled into that program so that um, we anticipate we were told by state DHS um, vaccine administrator on a call Monday that we can anticipate long-term care facilities getting vaccine by December 28th to start vaccinating vaccinating residents and their workers. Um, but yes, to answer your question and to give even more information, sorry about that, got long on, on my answer there. That is the entire state of Wisconsin, the roughly 149 doses. If there aren't any more questions about vaccines, um, we will, um, Ellie can take over and um, discuss data. I heard a lot of um, comments in public comment related to transparency and data, and I hope you are all um, um, excited um, to see this new data set and how much more information we have on there. Um, maybe not exactly some of the addressing all comments, that we heard in public comment today, but uh, we will work towards um, meeting everyone's needs. Um, that's, that's a hard thing to do in a pandemic, but we, we want to be transparent with data. Data is getting very complicated. Um, and I hope Ellie discusses a little bit about what is currently being um, displayed on our dashboard as, as our numbers, um, well, she can talk a little bit about um, confirmed cases and what they mean versus how many positives we actually are getting in St. Croix County in a day. All right, Ellie. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, Kelly. Um, yeah, so I am on this evening usually with a presentation for the board and those attending the meeting tonight. But instead, I am going to share with you um, our new St. Croix County dashboard. Um, we have developed this dashboard because we knew that our current dashboard did have limitations and we wanted to improve upon the knowledge that we were sharing and the information that we had um, related to COVID for the community. So, um, this dashboard will be, the link will be shared um, shortly um, with, our goal is at the end of this week, before the end of this week, we will transition to this new dashboard. We wanna just make sure all the technology pieces are in good working order. Um, and then the current dashboard will contain a link to direct you to this new dashboard, should you have that current dashboard bookmarked and want to change that information. Okay, so on this first page of the dashboard, you'll see kind of the COVID-19 summary. Now this data is current as of 12-15, which is yesterday. And that will be a continuing trend in that the dashboard will be updated. Um, for example, today, um, for the data for yesterday, because we want to have the full complete data and then update the following day with yeah, the day prior's data. So you'll see our total number of cases. Now, if you notice our current dashboard, that total number of cases is 4,983. And here it says 5,748. Well, these are true COVID-19 cases, but we have included those individual, we have included all individuals who have tested positive for COVID-19. And what is different is that we have also included the individuals who have tested by antigen testing. This is a growing trend in testing in our county and it is called the rapid test type of testing, okay? They were not included previously because according to the DHS, um, due to the rapid test um, and more information is linked on these types of tests, they are, these antigen tests are um, classified as probable, where a PCR or NAAT test, they are molecular tests and they are confirmed. 
more information on that in, in subsequent slides. We then have our current percent positive, which is our testing percent positive. Um, this is a, going to be updated weekly. And then we have our current hospitalizations. Now these are current hospitalizations of patients admitted in Western Wisconsin hospitals. I'll explain a little more. We have full in depth. So this is just kind of the snapshot and 22 total deaths. So then as you can see across the top, I don't know if you can see my mouse, but you can link all of these across the top page. Those are all links for you for the next page. So if we go to our current status, as of 1215, we did have 46 residents who tested positive on 1215. 29 of those were molecular tests. So that, that PCR test, that NETT, that consideration of confirmed. 17 of those were positive antigen tests, that rapid test consideration probable. Um, and then 63, though, is the seven day average of our, of residents testing positive. So all, these are all new residents. These are all new individuals. We are not repeating. These are no tests. No individual testing positive has been included twice. These are all unique individuals that we are counting. We always include a seven day average because that is kind of the smoothing of the curve. It doesn't jump up and down with the daily variance. Um, so you can see here it is the smoothing of the curve. What this dashboard does is you have the ability to remove and look at how antigen testing has been going. Now this graph, as you can see up here, is the past 30 days. So you can see how antigen testing has been going. We've had up to, we've had over 50 um, antigen, positive antigen tests in one day, and that was December 1st. Okay, if we take out the antigen testing, we can look at our seven day average of new cases. We do see a small drop in our, from we would we did, go over a um, kind of a hundred in our average new cases. And here we are now um, just about at 80 new cases. So if we want to look over all time, what does our trend really look like? Um, we are seeing that drop again that we saw in our seven day average. Um, and here these bars are stacked. So our total number of cases is the top of all of these lines. So we have our PCR tests in blue on the bottom, those molecular tests, and then we have the antigen tests stacked on top so we can get one line to be the total. If we look at cumulative, now what is cumulative? Cumulative is that number we saw here. Now if we link back to the summary page, this is our cumulative number. So we're constantly adding the cases. Let's head back to the current status and you can see how our cumulative number, this cumulative number of antigen positive is added onto that PCR positive number. Okay, let's move to, oh, I'm sorry, I forgot. So a very big important piece that I didn't fail to mention is this 41 this daily cases per 100,000 population. This is a metric that I have brought up in multiple presentations because this is a metric where it, it uses our population size to give us a number in which we can compare our case incidents, our number of daily cases to other populations that may have different population sizes. Um, so we are currently at 41 daily new cases per 100,000 people. Um, we've kind of talked about that um, that is a risk level indicator. We've talked about the Harvard metrics. And so yes, due to the Harvard metrics, which is here, our current um, risk level is at red. Now, what are those Harvard metrics? Do you want to read? Do you want to understand why we're using them and what they really measure? Go ahead and click on this. And I'm not going to do it in the moment because it will link me out and this is a link out to those Harvard metrics so you can read more on them. Okay, moving to hospitalizations and deaths. So our hospitalizations have changed some since we last reported them. Hospitalizations are now those patients currently admitted in Western Wisconsin hospitals. What are Western Wisconsin hospitals? They're listed down here. They're all our local hospitals. And so this measure is actually a measure of the burden of the patients that are 
in our hospitals. Now, these may not be St. Croix County residents, and we know, um, as to our current dashboard, that we have St. Croix County residents that are admitted um, in hospitals outside of St. Croix County. And so they may be over in Minnesota, or they're in Eau Claire, or in La Crosse. And as I posted as a disclaimer on our dashboard, it is difficult at times when someone is in the hospital and we don't have daily communication with all those hospital personnel from all those potential hospitals um, to know when a patient is exactly discharged and exactly admitted. Um, and we want to be able to give you that current information, but unfortunately due to the size of um, having 50 people hospitalized, having to track all those individuals and then more individuals being hospitalized on a daily basis and discharging as well, um, we, weren't, we aren't able to provide up-to-date information consistently. And so we have switched to this, which is reported by these Western Wisconsin hospitals. And so we can see this number as these are the COVID-19 patients that they have within their hospitals. Okay. And then this is another look at just availability of our local hospitals, um, which you can see in the inpatient beds available. With We're currently at Green, which is 10 plus beds available. And then the Twin Cities metro bed capacity. What is kind of their availability? Should someone need to be transferred to the metro area? They're currently, that Twin Cities metro is currently at a yellow. Okay. The other side of this piece of the dashboard on the slide is the deaths. So this data will be updated as a new death does occur. Now these are total deaths with COVID-19 listed as a cause or a contributing factor to death. We are not able to update deaths until we do have um, that death report that tells us that COVID-19 was the cause or contributing factor of death. So there is a lag here. We just want to make sure that we have all of the documentation required to publish this as a COVID-19 death. What you do have in regards to the current 22 deaths um, that we've unfortunately had here in St. Croix County is the age and gender information. Now, if you hover over any part of this circle, you will see the percentage that that age group of the in that age group that has contributed to the number of deaths. So 20 27% of the deaths were in people who are 90 or greater years of age. And 60 to 69, there were 14% of the deaths. In gender, we can see that males constitute 68% of the COVID-19 deaths in St. Croix County. Okay, moving on to demographics. This is a slide that will be updated weekly. And this is, a t this is kind of the distribution of all cases of those who tested positive for COVID-19. So if you ever tested positive by antigen test or by PCR or NAAT test, you are included in these graphics. These are the age categories, kind of the age distribution, where again, we see our highest range here in our 20 to 60, 20 to 59 year old age range. That's pretty consistent for our county. The gender is about 50-50, 51% female, 49% male. Ethnicity, we have 80% are not Hispanic or Latino. Moving on, then we'll provide, we provide some testing information. So currently we are at 27% COVID-19, 27% positive um, COVID-19 tests by person. So of all people tested, 27% um, of the tests are coming back positive. This is another one of the seven day averages. So we don't have the daily blips, um, but this, indicator here is only the confirmed testing. Why? Because this information actually comes from the Wisconsin DHS and this is how they release their positive tests and negative tests. Um, if we want to look at where we've been, here's the positive tests, here's the negative tests. So basic, so we are taking those positive tests and dividing them by the total of positive and negative tests. Now, 
when I say tests, this is one person, one test. Okay. I know multiple people, people test multiple times due to healthcare work, due to um, understanding. If you test positive as a person, you're only, you're only in there once. If you test negative, you're only in there once. Okay. So this is by person. Let's look at our percent positive trend. So I'm going to remove negative tests and I'm going to remove the positive tests. As we can see, we did have that great jump of cases kind of in early November. Um, and here we are at the end of December. And in looking at this data, our percent positive hasn't shifted much. So we are still seeing by all those who, by individuals testing, we are still getting approximately the same amount testing positive. Um, this is a great measure for looking at, is there still a lot of disease in our community? Because if we have a large majority testing positive, as I've mentioned before, that means that we're obviously not capturing all the disease in the community. Um, when the metric is 5%, our goal is to have less than 5% testing positive. And why we want a low percent positive is because we are testing a large amount and we're only finding a little bit of disease under 5%. That means that we're doing enough testing, we're finding all the disease and there's only 5%, where we here in St. Croix County are at 27%. Onto the last uh, page in our new dashboard. This is just an awareness for the public of what public health is at, where our response to COVID-19 is. Our current level is considered the critical standards of practice. Why we consider critical standards of practice is because we've had to shift um, our priorities and shift in our ability to act contact everyone who has COVID-19. So for example, we are currently unable to call all of those that test positive within 24 hours. That is our standard of practice is to call everyone within 24 hours to make a point of contact. Unfortunately, there are still too many cases where this is not a possibility. Therefore, we have made a prioritization of positive cases. Individuals 18 years and under and 60 years and older are prioritized to be called first upon a positive test result. For those who are not called within 48 hours, we are sending phone messages, texts, and emails from public health, identifying ourselves as public health, and providing information to aid in the ne in next steps following test results. Here, there is a link. This is a link. So what what to do if you do test positive, if you haven't gotten that information, if you have test positive and you are worried, or if someone has identified you as a close contact, meaning you have been exposed to COVID-19. Click on this link and it will direct you to our website where more information is available. The last box here on our data FAQs, this will link you directly to a document which will go through each measure found on this data dashboard and will identify and explain what that measure means, how we and how we are calculating it and why we are using it, kind of to aid in the greater transparency of what is going on and what we're providing on the St. Croix County COVID-19 dashboard. Um, I believe that is the end of our my presentation of the new dashboard and we hope this is a new tool that will help the community in kind of understanding um, our current situation with COVID-19. Thank you. Are there any questions? I'm happy to answer. Kelly, I had a question. Um, Thank you for this. It's really great work. I know I'm sure it was a huge amount of work and thanks to the team that helped put this together, whoever they are, um, besides you. Um, wondering about if that, that graphic that you have with the PCR and antigen tests. So if you get an antigen test, sometimes there's a confirming PCR test. Is this, is it counted as one person again or is it, I just making sure there's not double counting. 
No, once you are, once you antigen test and due to your results, there may be the necessity for a PCR test. And if you are PCR test, those people all are linked by the individual, by their name, by all their personal information. And so their status is changed upon a PCR result immediately. And so they're st they will then not be counted as an antigen any longer and be counted as a PCR. Perfect. Thanks. That's what I thought. Mm -hmm. I have some questions. Go ahead. Um, it's brought up today, tonight, on uh, some of the comments, if we could see results by city. I, I like what you're doing with the dashboard. Can we break it down by city or town in St. Croix County? We can. We do have map abilities. Um, and that is definitely a goal of us, of the department and myself um, as the epidemiologist in working with our GIS people. Um, this program we chose specifically does have uh, does have map abilities to include. Um, it is quite an undertaking in terms of address mapping by school district. We do have those abilities, um, and that's kind of like this is phase one, and we are going to keep improving and keep working on this to include other pieces. Good. Of course, it brings up another question: What is limiting us to do more testing? I can try to take that one a little bit. Um, so I think right now, and and please know that I am meeting, um, we moved, I think I reported last month, we moved to a tri-county. So Pierce, Polk, and St. Croix counties are meeting weekly with every hospital CEO or president, whichever title they go by, on a weekly basis. And a lot, all hospitals have reported over the last two weeks, they have seen less and less people um, showing up for testing. We know also uh, in our community, Wisconsin National Guard testing sites, our numbers have dropped. They've dropped at the state level um, upwards to 10 to 11,000 average tests per day. Um, so we know testing, like, the need or the the people seeking tests has dropped. So I, I your question is a good one, um, and I don't know exactly how to answer it. Dr. McGinnis, do you have thoughts on that you want to add? I think, you know, there's obviously a couple of big factors. First thing is just access to testing, and I think that has indeed improved with the availability of the University of Wisconsin River Falls, although that may be going away in January and also through the uh, wing, which is the Wisconsin National Guard testing. That's the free testing that's uh, cited throughout the county. Um, also, the capacity within hospitals and clinics has improved. Um, there can be a charge for that, and it's generally covered by your insurance, but that gets into a whole other realm of things. Um, the long story short, I think, is that if we truly have a dramatic decrease in the number of folks who are ill, that would be wonderful. I'm concerned that a lot of people who are having mild symptoms um, are not getting tested, and so we're missing cases and the ability to ask people to, to isolate or and uh, close quarantines to or close contacts to quarantine. So that's that's the thing we don't know: is it just people aren't going in, or is there truly um, a decrease? The data would hint that maybe there's not as much of a decrease as we would like to see, and the, the drop off in testing is a concern. Um, um, then one other thing, you know. Somebody also commented about not being able to afford the testing, and you just mentioned that, Paul. Um, isn't I thought there there is supposed to be free testing if you have symptoms, no matter what, if you have insurance or not. Yeah. So, and I don't know if that Dr. McGinnis, did you want to address that? Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. Go ahead and take it first, Kelly. Sure. So there was a federal program um, and there's also a pilot program for the states that providers clinics could apply for and then get some reimbursement for the cost of the test. And our um, facilities, two out of the four in St. Croix County have done that. The wing testing that um, both Dr. McGinnis and I have talked about, the Wisconsin um, National Guard testing that is going to continue until March 4th, uh, new location, Baldwin, Wood, or not Woodville, Baldwin Highway Shop, um, the county's property, um, will continue every Thursday in that 
is completely free testing. Well, just one anecdote, I guess. Uh, I know uh, I know somebody who went to Menominee to be tested and got a the full charge for the test was like thirteen hundred dollars. I don't understand the cost at a hospital or a clinic for thirteen hundred dollars. Uh, her her portion was dropped down to about a hundred dollars because of insurance or whatever, but still it's a hundred dollars. But where's the thirteen hundred dollars come from? Well, that all depends if she had a visit with a provider. I'm not sure which health system. No, I know it, it was not a provider. It was a, a, a testing clinic at um, at um, Menominee okay. area. There, I can't remember. Oh, okay. It wasn't St. Croix County, but again, She's Dunn right. County. But yeah, that's, that's ridiculous. The cost. Yeah, I, I agree with that, and I do know clinics um, are all working, um, you know, through their financial pieces and their mechanisms to try to recoup some costs related to whether it's a provider bit. I, I understand in this particular instance it wasn't a provider visit, but they can charge um, certain amounts for all kinds of different services rendered, whether it was even a telehealth you know, consult or what, whatever. Um, and, and that is frustration. I'm dealing, I'm dealing even on a personal level um, related to doctoring. And, and, and it's really frustrating because I feel like I'm an educated healthcare professional and insurance is one of the most frustrating things to have to deal with. Um, and I feel like I'm kind of you know, health healthcare literate, if you will, so to speak. Um, and I even can't understand all the different complexities that goes into, um, you know, the cost of healthcare. It is definitely an issue that this country faces, for sure. Yeah. Okay, I think that's it for now for me. And I just wanted to say something quickly regarding testing. The, the piece about testing, too, is, I guess, the understanding of kind of the buildup when there was a lack of testing that people only went get to get tested if they were symptomatic. And I think, and Harvard now has done a push um, for a new testing toolkit and communication resources just to help people really understand that just kind of the when, the why, and the and for us, we have information for Sankar County on the where to get tested even if they feel healthy. Um, and kind of, I think there's more messaging that we can do to, to, to provide informed information that it isn't just a symptomatic um, testing need as well. I, I have a question. Um, is there any um, push in Wisconsin? Are they going to have, like Minnesota has the home at home test kits? Do, are those available in Wisconsin at all? Has there been any talk about that? Kelly, do you know? Yeah, we have talked about it um, with the state on multiple occasions, um, specifically even with the same vendor, vendor that um, the Minnesota Department of Health went um, went through. They're a company called Vault Testing, um, and the state of we actually met with Vault Testing as a region just to try to understand kind of the different tests they had available and services um, when we. We found out through that demonstration with Vault that um, they were also in talks with the state of Wisconsin, but we did find out the state of Wisconsin is not to not pursuing that particular um, that particular provider. And at this point, I do not believe we have not been made aware of any efforts to increase home testing in the state of Wisconsin. It may be happening at a state level we're just not aware of, but at this point, I don't know of any. I have a few different questions. Um, about the hospitalizations, I don't know if you can go back to that slide. Um, I'm just curious, it showed the, the Western Wisconsin um, bed capacity as well as the Twin Cities but it had the scales the same. Um, so the green level, the, the yellow level were the same. And I'm just curious how, how we're figuring that out because it, it seems like ICU bed capacity in the Twin Cities 
we would be more concerned if they only have four beds left in all of the Twin Cities because there's a denser population there um, versus four in the in the uh, Western Wisconsin area. Does that, can you maybe just say more about that? Yeah, I can. Um, that actually, that was copied, I think, inappropriately from the Western Wisconsin bed region. And this is a metric that we are getting um, from the Western Wisconsin kind of con consortium themselves. Um, um, and so, yeah, so Kelly you knows more. Um, yeah, uh, can I just, I and I'm sorry to interrupt you or cut you off, Ellie. I just want everyone to be aware, this is not from our consortium. This is specifically, um, I have reported the hospital's chief nursing officers have asked um, from the Tri-County, Pierce, Polk, and St. Croix to better understand each other's bed, avail bed availability. So that is exactly where this data is coming from specific to the Western region. It is coming from a dashboard that Alina had set up and is coordinating for all of the hospitals in Pierce, Polk, and St. Croix County. Sorry, yeah, Ellie. I think that's excellent, and I'm, I'm really glad to see that. I think it's important information, and it helps us um, understand, obviously, um, what our capacity is. I guess I'm just, I, I'm just not quite understanding, though, maybe the scale, because the scale of Western Wisconsin beds versus the Twin Cities beds, I would think, would look a little bit different. So maybe, maybe if you yep. can say more about that as well. They do, and I think. As, I'm sorry, I, I may have spoke too quickly. It may have been, I think it is a mis, it was a quick, or it was an accidental copy as we were adjusting um, the dashboard. And so the, in creating anything, there's always why this isn't launched to the public yet. Um, things that you do notice that you thought you read this 16 million times and it still says the same thing. Um, it was an accidental copy from the, Western Wisconsin bed capacity to the Twin Cities metro bed capacity. Okay, I see. <laughs> <laughs> and um, so we will, that will be cleared up before this goes public. Okay, perfect. Thank, Thank you. you. Mm -hmm. um, and it looks, it looks great. Otherwise, I just was confused by that part. Um, another question that I have is about the close context, just a clarifying question. So on that, I think it was the last page um, where, where you had public health response. Um, so close contacts, are they getting some type of electronic notification now? Because obviously you can't, um, there's just way too many to contact everyone, but do they get some type of notification from public health? No, they do not, unfortunately, at this time. Close contacts are asked we are asking the positive cases to identify and communicate with their pos with their close contacts. We are providing those positive cases with information for those close contacts um, to share with them. Um, multiple types on you know on quarantine measures and so forth. And so that is our current kind of where we're at with the crisis standards that we're unable to contact close contacts directly. But our website also contains the information that a close contact would need. Okay, got it. Thank you. I just wanted to clarify that because I remember that from the previous meeting, but on the, the page, I, I wondered if, if that meant that close contacts would receive some type of, of just electronic communication. So um, the last question that I have that has come up a, a couple times is just about testing for the flu and um, influenza numbers, and I know that that, you know, really flu season is really just starting. Um, do we have any information about about the flu as well yet? Are we hearing anything or seeing um, positive cases in the area? We get, and remember, if for flu to be reportable to public health, they have to be a hospitalization. Otherwise, flu is not reportable to your local health department. Okay. Yeah, and not everybody, yeah, and we probably don't do a great job articulating that. Um, we do get a state report from um, the Bureau of Communicable Disease at the state level, um, specific to respiratory illnesses on a weekly basis. And of course, Natasha, I did not look at it this week. Um, I know activity level is very low um, and 
I think two weeks ago when I looked at it, we hadn't seen more than five cases statewide. I mean, super low. But again, I apologize. I have not looked at it yet this week. If that is something the board is interested in and um, wants to see that on a weekly basis, we certainly could try to find a way to communicate that to the board. I, I'm hesitant to do that publicly because I think there's a lot of, um, dis not discrepancies, but people, anytime you put data out without an explanation, um, I think people start drawing their own conclusions. And we've been trying to be pretty careful with that. We are so thankful Ellie's here as she does a great job trying to help educate and understand the complexities of data. Um, but yeah, we let's work on that for sure, if that's something you guys are interested in. Yeah, I, I mean, I think it is good information to be aware of um, if, if we can get that information. Thank you. Any other questions for Kelly or Ellie? Okay, seeing none, we're gonna move on. Kelly and Ellie, we, uh, we thank you both. And, and Kelly, um, again, this board uh, can't begin to thank you and uh, your entire staff for all the great work that you are doing and it is greatly, greatly appreciated. Thank you. Uh, we'll move on then to our nursing home administrator, Ms. Sandy. Good evening. Thanks for having me. A little update on COVID and how we've been doing um, at the facility, which is absolutely wonderful. Um, we have had a total of 16 positive COVID, um, six being non-direct staff, which would be people that are not doing the resident, direct resident care. And we have had nine direct resident um, caregivers with positive COVID. Of all of the um, tests and positives, we've had one resident that has recovered and is doing well. And a little bit about the numbers. We had one case in July, one in August. We had no cases in September. We had eight cases in October and um, five cases in November. Orchard View Terrace, our assisted living, has had no cases until November. We had two positive staff members. And in December so far, we have had one positive staff person. And we, our last case was on December 8th, and we are currently in outbreak status, which means we have to be 14 days out from a positive staff person. And so we can look to be out of outbreak status on the 23rd. We continue to test our staff twice a week because the county um, activity and positivity rate is high. And um, we're testing all our staff on Tuesdays and Fridays, and our, vet, our um, results don't come back extremely fast. So on Tuesday, sometimes we're receiving the final results on Friday. Um, so we've been trying to figure out how to make that work faster, but it just doesn't. It's just the, the load that goes into the, um, the testing um, agencies. We use uh, one in West Alice, which is assigned to us by the Department of Health. And um, our transportation is by UPS. And um, like everything else, UPS is a little slow for our test getting down there um, to West Alice too. So we did go through, um, we had outbreak status in Orchard View, which we have now cleared. Um, we tested all of our residents and our staff for um, two weeks and they are all cleared there. We have started readmission, readmitting our residents. Um, this week we've admitted two people back to our facility on a wing that has not been affected um, by anyone that has a positive case of COVID. We do maintain all of um, the PPE. Right now we're using 100% um, PPE whenever we go into a resident room, because all of our residents are currently in quarantine, which means all our staff wear gowns, masks, gloves, and goggles or face shields. Um, so we're just doing, we're doing well. 
I did want to address one thing that was brought up earlier, and um, we pay very, very close attention to our residents, and we meet on a daily basis and discuss their mental health as well as their physical health. And if we see a resident that is declining mentally, physically, or um, they have a change in condition, we really do talk about having family members come in. Then we do bring family members in and have, and we teach them about proper use of PPE, how to hand wash, we screen them, and then we um, make sure we walk with them to make sure they just stay in that one area because we can't have res people all over the facility. So we never, ever, ever have to have people crawl through windows. Um, and our residents never die alone. There is always family with them, and we're very, very um, careful about making sure that we're looking out for our residents because they're our family too, and we want to make sure that they have their loved ones and family with them. At, um, even if they've had a decline, sometimes we brought a family member in, they've perked up, they've done better, and then we haven't brought them in again. Um, and, but we keep an eye on them, you know, appetite, weight, um, their mental status, all of those things matter. Um, so that's what's going up on at the health center right now. And you heard the testing update. Um, so we are looking forward to the testing. We are doing some education. Um, every week I've been doing some education for family, and we are trying to work on some more um, efficient way to send out information for our families and so they can get things quicker because of the new digital age. Um, so we are working on some of those issues. Does anybody have any questions? I'd just like to say thank you for all the work you're doing and all the care you're giving our, our re the residents there. We really appreciate it. I just have to tell you, I have, there is such awesome staff here. Um, I can't say enough about the staff. They are, they truly do consider the residents their family. And Sandy, do you still, do you folks still do the uh, temperature test uh, on each shift as, as the employees are coming in? Every, every, every employee is screened when they come in the facility if they have um, a, a, a note about considering flu vaccine or flu, when we have anybody that has any symptom at all, they need to contact our infection preventionist. She talks with them and we have had people tested both for influenza and for COVID to make sure that we are not dealing with influenza um, because that does actually um, spread throughout a facility pretty quickly too. So. Um, we also screen every one of our residents every shift. We do an assessment on every resident every shift. We, temp we do temperatures on them every shift. Even though right now um, that isn't a great indication, um, they're finding that um, temperature is more when you're in the more active stage of having COVID. But we are con continuing to monitor everybody. So I think that's why we're catching things so quickly um, the combination of the testing and the combination of if anybody has any symptoms, they're not allowed to come to work until they have had another test, even if it's off cycle, so that we can assure that they're um, negative and then we allow them to come back to work. So. Anyone else have a question, comment? Because of that, Sandy, are you able to maintain your staffing pretty well right now? We are. Um, we, we Right now our census is down because we weren't admitting for a while. So that's been um, kind of a helpful, non-helpful thing. Um, but that has been helpful. And our staff does step up to the plate and um, we do have some on call. We have some college kids that are returning that go into the testing cycle. Um, so that helps because right now college is not, a lot of kids aren't in college right now, they're at home. 
So um, there was a time where we were a little concerned when we all of a sudden had two full-time people out on the evening shift, um, but we're adjusting to it and we're, it, you know, at first when it happens, you become worried, but the staff all steps up, we rearrange things, we rearrange workloads, and we do have a staffing plan in place, so. Great. Anyone else? Well, Sandy, you you, uh, you and I well know I, I know most of your uh, your staff up there uh, personally, and and you guys do a tremendous job, uh, top to bottom. And please pass that on. How much we appreciate all the good work that they are doing as well. Thank you for being with us. I will tell them. Thank you. Okay, and with that, we're going to move on to uh, item number two is a report from the West Gap regarding the housing issues. Uh, Bob, do you want to do any introductions with uh, Miss Robin that is, that is here? And we, uh, I'm sorry it's taken us so long to get to you, Robin. Oh, no, this has been fascinating. Craig, Craig, this is part of, I think this is, might help you out on some of the questions that you had at our last meeting. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and, and uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, Robin, thank you for uh, being patient and uh, oh, absolutely. agreeing to present tonight. Uh, I had a chance just to briefly interact with Robin on email uh, and asked her to present uh, a little more on what WestCap is doing and how we can partner a little more closely or at least um, re-engage with them uh, to address the issue of homelessness. And then Robin's graciously agreed to meet with me in early January to go in more depth on ideas that we might have to uh, address this problem. But um, I'll turn it over to you, Robin. You've been waiting long enough and uh, I'll let you do your presentation. Oh, no, that's fine. And you know, it's, it's helpful to hear um, all the information on the pandemic because of course that's been uppermost in our minds as well at West Cap, and we've been doing, um, we've had to change a lot of the ways that we're doing things and, and whatnot. So it, it's good to hear um, the conversation. At any rate, I did send a PowerPoint and I'm wondering if you have that to put up or if you, I know that people got it in their packets and I could just uh, read through it as well, whatever works for you. Do we have that, Colleen, that we could um, share, or are you able to do that? It is in the packet. Um, I don't know that I can share it. Um, let me see. Or if I can share my screen, I guess. Um, so let me let me bring it up. All this new technology is so much fun, isn't it? <laughs> Okay, um, I'm beginning. Okay. And let's see if I go share screen. Okay, there, can you see it now? Yes, we yes. can. Yes, yes. Um, thank you. Okay, I wasn't even thinking that uh, I, I could do this part, but this is perfect. All right, um, so West Central Wisconsin Community Action Agency is our full name, uh, West Cap for short, and just a brief history of community action agencies so you understand them. Um, most are private nonprofit agencies a few, like the Social Development Commission in Milwaukee, are a public-private um, combination. But we are, uh, WestCap is a 501c3 nonprofit. A lot of folks think of us as a government agency, but we are not. Um, and community action agencies came out of the war on poverty um, in 65, um, and uh, there's about a thousand across the United States and almost every area is covered 
uh, by a community action agency. Um, there's only two counties uh, in Southeast Wisconsin that are not. But the purpose of them was to combat um, poverty on a local level rather than a federal one size fits all um, program. So our, our mission is to take action against poverty by developing the social and economic assets of low income families and their communities and by working to create a more just and sustainable society. So um, I was asked to talk about housing tonight and housing is a huge um, part of what we do because um, part of the issue uh, with being low income is um, not being able to afford housing. So just to give you a few statistics, um, in the Minneapolis metro area, which includes St. Croix Pierce and some of Polk County, uh, the wage needed for a two bedroom unit um, at fair market rent is $23.35 an hour. And um, in 2020, the fair market rent for a two bedroom was $1,214. It's going up um, almost $100 in 2021. And then just for comparison, in Dunn County, the wage is much lower. It's $15.17, and the fair market rent is actually going down um, in, in Dunn County. And that's the Out of Reach 2020 report, which is a very um, informative report that comes out every year. So um, I'm sure that most, if not all of you, have heard about the United Way Alice report. And um, if you haven't, and you haven't had a chance to look at it, I highly recommend it. They break it down by county, and they also give an overview of Wisconsin as a whole. And, it, and it's an excellent, excellent report. Um, so the part I pulled out about St. Croix County, you can see that, um, there's about 34,500 almost households in, in um, <clears throat> St. Croix County that meet the Alice um, that are, oh, I'm sorry, there's about 35,000 households in St. Croix County and the median household income is much higher than um, the state average Unemployment rate has been historically low in St. Croix County, but the Alice households are almost the same in St. Croix County, which um, stands for Asset Limited Income Constrained and Employed. So 22% um, of the households can't afford to survive um, on their salaries in, in St. Croix County. So a survival budget, you can see, um, and remember that $23 and, and some odd sense that it takes to afford a two bedroom apartment, um, the survival budget for two adults and two school age kids, you would need $31 and 52 cents. Um, if you have two kids in daycare, it goes up to almost $39. So as you can see, uh, it's really a math problem. People can, can afford housing. Um, the Outer Reach Report also points out that the Minneapolis St. Paul Metropolitan Statistical Area is the most expensive housing area in Wisconsin. Um, so um, it, it's very hard for low income houses, households. Now, West Cap, like I said, um, has a number of programs um, to address the needs of low income uh, households. And because uh, you wanted me to talk about housing, I listed out all the different housing areas that we um, work in. We partner with uh, for-profit developers to provide affordable housing. Um, we just finished uh, this past year a 35 unit housing development in North Hudson called Abbey Grove. And our next housing development will be completed uh, next year, next spring, uh, summer, 
um, in um, River Falls. <clears throat> and then we've also applied to do tax credit housing in New Richmond as well. And the, the affordable housing development is a quite a complicated um, endeavor. We work with a for-profit developer. We bring in nonprofit um, financing that they can't get as a for-profit developer. And um, both parties work with um, the cities and um, local governments to um, get different financing at the municipality level that also helps provide that housing in communities. Uh, we also do property management. So some of the low income housing tax credit developments that we do, we end up owning um, after they meet their 15 year um, affordability period. And that way we can keep them low income instead of them being purchased by market rate um, uh, landlords and turned into market rate housing. So we manage um, almost 400 units of housing ourselves as well. We have a number of different homeless intervention programs and I'll go into uh, detail on that later. We also do weatherization, which low income homeowners and renters can take advantage of if they apply for energy assistance. We provide um, through a subcontract the energy assistance in St. Croix County and then we um, have a contract with the state for Pepin and Dunn counties. And then some of our other programs involve food, transportation, adult education, and some smaller community programs like backpack programs for kids to take um, food home after school and our holiday gift program that serves um, areas that aren't already served. So like I said, with the project development um, for low income housing, there, it requires a lot of partnerships, um, developers, investors, um, community housing development organization, which is what we are, and the city that it's going to be in. And determining those housing needs is um, a complicated process. It, it involves a market study. And I know Western, West Wisconsin Regional Planning Commission has also done housing studies, um, which have been very valuable. Uh, I know they just finished one in Barron. Um, Dave Armstrong from the economic development up there led that, uh, had them come up and do that. And I believe Polk County also had one. Um, they're very helpful in determining what you have in your county and then what the projection is of what you'll need, how many housing units at all the different levels, not just low income, but all of the different levels that you need. Um, so knowing what the job base is, the labor rate and different amenities and public transportation are, are also very key in um, scoring in the tax credit applications and being able to bring that money um, up into our neck of the woods. A lot of the tax credit applications do tend to go to larger metropolitan areas because they can score higher, especially in the amenities in the public transportation, which we don't always have in our rural communities. Um, they are, if you have an opportunity to um, comment on the consolidated plan that the Department of uh, Energy, Housing and Community Resources has just put out. I believe the deadline is around the 20th of December, something like that. But um, commenting on that and, and pushing for um, housing in the rural areas is, is very helpful. It has um, increased uh, the, the scoring for rural areas in the past. And so taking a look at that consolidated plan from Decker is um, important um, as community leaders that you are um, to comment on that plan. So if, if you haven't, please take a look at it. Um, like I said, there's a number of different financing options. We bring in some as a nonprofit, the for-profit developers bring in others. Um, <clears throat> We've done a lot in our last couple of um, projects with focus on energy. 
and really being able to build green housing, which not only is important for the environment, but in terms of keeping these low income housing projects uh, operational and the cash flow um, to keep them maintained, having that energy um, be more stable by using solar and geothermal and other, um, other technicalities that <laughs> I am definitely not an expert on, but um, they bring those into the project and that keeps that cost low so that um, it doesn't uh, eat into the reserve for those um, projects. So the other thing um, that is really important to the low-income families in in our service territory is the homeless intervention programs that we run and there's a number of them. We have rapid rehousing, tenant-based rental assistance, permanent supportive housing, and then we do um, provide the Section 8 housing choice vouchers in Dunn, St. Croix, Pierce, and Polk counties outside of the cities that have uh, like the River Falls, uh, the city of River Falls Housing Authority has buildings, but we provide it in the areas um, that, that aren't uh, don't have buildings and don't have a city housing authority. Um, but the rapid rehousing and the permanent supportive housing are funded through HUD and also the state and tenant-based rental assistance comes through the state. And these are all different um, programs. And if, if somebody has a question on eligibilities later, I can certainly answer those questions. But um, they're meant for people, the rapid rehousing and the permanent supportive housing, HUD requires us to um, use their definition of homelessness, which means somebody has to be in a shelter, fleeing from domestic violence, or uh, in a place not fit for human habitation, like their car, a storage unit, um, outside. Um, we get uh, a lot of questions and a lot of phone calls from people that, uh, you know, they're sleeping on their uncle's couch or, you know, they're staying with a friend. Unfortunately, those programs, they are not eligible for because they have a roof over their head. So those HUD homeless programs are really meant for the most vulnerable um, people, uh, people that absolutely have nowhere else to go. The tenant-based rental assistance um, that, um, that can be used for people that are at risk of being homeless, but aren't actually homeless yet. The rapid rehousing and the tenant-based rental programs can only go up to 24 months. The permanent supportive housing program, because that is meant for the most severe cases, um, people have to have a disability and they have to have been homeless for a length of time. Uh, that one is permanent. They are in that program until they don't need that level of support any longer. Um, currently, all of our programs are full. Um, we are almost full with the tenant-based rental assistance, but the homeless programs are full. At any point in time in our service area, which is uh, Barron, Chippewa, Dunn, Pepin, Pierce, Polk, and St. Croix, we have what's called a coordinated entry list. And it's anybody that's homeless that we have uh, been in contact with or that's been referred and we've done an assessment and we have them on a list. Um, at any point in time, we have between um, 200 and 250 households on that list for our service territory. And we have 45 units that we can fill in permanent supportive housing and um, about 25 that we can fill in rapid. Um, and then tenant-based rental assistance is around 40. So, and like I said, those are full and we still have, you know, 200, 250 folks on our, on our list. So some of the ways we look at reducing homelessness in our communities is um, really identifying landlords and trying to um, 
trying to work with them because all of our programs, we rely on private landlords in the community to take a chance on the folks that we work with. The folks that we work with have multiple barriers to having stable housing. They have evictions, they're fleeing domestic violence or other violence, and um, many times they have um, mental illnesses that manifest and make it difficult for them to maintain um, stable housing. Uh, many of them have become addicted to substances because illegal substances or alcohol because that is the only way they've been able to cope with being outside. Um, so we work very hard with the landlords in our community to um, house our clients. Um, reducing tenant screening barriers is a huge issue. Um, having the housing authorities institute a homeless preference. Um, we negotiate with them on lease terms. Sometimes we're paying security deposit, first month's rent and last month's rent just to get somebody in a unit. Um, we've tried working with a, a couple of um, different um, places to establish a risk mitigation fund for landlords. So say somebody, they take a chance on somebody and um, the person like, for instance, we had one fellow that was paranoid schizophrenic and he put holes in the walls because he thought that there were voices coming from the wall. He wasn't purposely trying to damage the wall. He was trying to stop whatever noise he thought he heard coming from the wall. So if we, we try to have develop risk mitigation funds to pay for things like that because the landlord needs to be compensated for it. The person that's living there still needs a place to live because what, what are they gonna do on the street, right? It's not their fault that they are schizophrenic. It's not something that they can control. Um, the case managers um, work a lot with the landlords to address tenancy issues. Um, we try to provide incentives to landlords um, and and work very hard to strengthen the household support system. So whether it's other agencies, mental health providers, physical health providers, uh, friends, family, et cetera. Um, and then eviction prevention financial assistance, which lately has been a huge thing. We have literally had hundreds of phone calls every single week. Um, for people that need rent assistance because they have been laid off because of the pandemic um, or they've had to stay home because their kids are home and they're too young to stay home alone. They're not, they're, they're young elementary students. Um, they um, <clears throat> haven't gotten unemployment or the people that have had to quit and stay home with their kids aren't eligible for un unemployment. So this, uh, the state had the Wisconsin Rent Assistance Program. We um, spent, we got out over a million dollars in from June to November of rent assistance. And that wasn't staff money, that was just straight up rent assistance that went out the door. Um, <clears throat> people could get up to $3,000. Well, now that's done. The moratorium ends at the end of December and let me tell you, people are very scared about what's going to happen to them um, because landlords are going to be able to evict them. So we have some money um, from Community Services Block Grant and St. Croix um, uh, Valley Foundation and um, some other donors that we are using um, but it's going to be used up very quickly um, because it's nowhere near a million dollars. So uh, other resources in St. Croix County for housing uh, includes Grace Place, um, Shelter, Turning Point, which is for domestic violence. Uh, there are housing authorities um, and then food pantries um, and some other resources there, which you, I'm sure you're all very familiar with. 
And then on our website, I put the link there. Uh, we have a list of resources um, for St. Croix County. We try to keep that up to date as much as we uh, can. And there is my contact information. So the other thing I put in the packet as well was a, a piece um, from Out of Reach. So you could look at um, some of that data a little more closely. But um, I am happy to take any questions that you all might have. Any questions for Robin? Robin, I have a question, if I may. Sure. Um, first of all, thank you for the presentation. It was very informative and also I would say quite uh, sobering given some of the situation that we're in. Um, I did have a question about, um, you mentioned the list that you have for your programs. You said 200, 250 people are on the list. Um, I'm curious how uh, you manage that list. How do people get on the list? Um, how do you, as you go through it, is it just basically you go for the top of the list and go down as things become available? Or can you just talk a little bit about um, that process? Absolutely. Um, so HUD, Housing and Urban Development, requires um, the homeless programs to have what's called a coordinated entry list. And so when we get referrals from other agencies for people that are homeless or people call us themselves, we do an intake and um, our intake specialist does an assessment with the person and it's got a really long name. It's a vulner vulnerability index assessment basically. And it asks questions like how long have they been on the street? Uh, do they have a physical disability? Do they have a mental disability? Um, just a, a whole list of questions. And at the end, it gives the person a score and the higher the score, the basically the more likely that person is to die on the street. That is why that assessment was developed. And so when people get on the list, we have when we have an opening, we have to take the person with the very highest score first. So it's like an emergency room triage, basically. So the score goes up to 20, it's zero to 20. Um, People, I can tell you, people that are below 10 are going to stay on that list forever or figure it out themselves because we don't, we're never going to have the resources to get that low. Um, so, you know, the people in our permanent supportive housing have scores uh, generally 16 and above. They are, they've They've been homeless over a year, physical, mental disabilities, just a load of barriers. Um, the people in the rapid rehousing program have, you know, probably between, you know, 13, 14 and, and, and up. Um, so, yeah. It's, it's very frustrating. It's frustrating for the people that are homeless. It is frustrating for the people that are trying to serve them. Um, there's just not enough resources. And I can tell you without a doubt that there is going to be um, an increase in homelessness after, after the first of the year because there's going to be a lot of people evicted that have not been able to pay their rent and they will not have the resources um, to go anywhere. The shelters are full now. So. Anyone else have a question for Robin? Greg, does this helped you out at all? I mean, it's good information, but it doesn't. You know, what's the answer? I mean, what what can be done? I mean, work, pour more money at it, work with more more cities, more builders. What what do we do? So, um, I mean, you're have, you're talking about you have what six counties you work with or something like that? Seven. Seven. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yep. I mean, you're spread pretty thin yourself. 
Oh, well, yeah. Uh, I mean, we have staff. <laughs> right? right. But, um, but some of the things that, that cities can do, too, especially um, on, uh, on the housing development end of things, is to really look at your zoning rules and how many, um, what kind of housing you allow. Like, is it all big yards and single family homes? Um, where, where would you allow a shelter to be? Do you have a warming shelter for just the winter months? You know, um, and yes, it does take resources. It does take money because, um, you know, and the other thing it takes is a, a real good um, job base. So where can people earn a living that they can afford, a, you know, low income housing? That's a big piece. Like you saw, it's a little over $23 an hour somebody needs to make to afford a two bedroom apartment. So, you know, if you're a single mom with two kids, you can't afford that. No. So, you know, looking at uh, when new industry comes in, do they have to um, <clears throat> hire so many low-income workers? You know, what kind of education and supports do we give to, um, uh, you know, daycare or foster kids that are turning 19 and leaving foster care. You know, a lot of those kids end up homeless. What, what are the supports that we have in our community to make sure that people have an opportunity to work or get an education and whatever job they have, they can afford to live somewhere? Well, what scares me is cold weather January 1st. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What can, what can be done? Yeah. Well, um, Grace Place does an amazing job. I will say I absolutely love Duana Bremer. She will make as much room as she possibly can in the shelter. The shelters have been hit hard because of the pandemic, too. They've, you know, it's, it's been really hard. So um, are there other buildings like Grace Place that can be turned into low-income housing? Uh, of course, you know, we had the issue with the Lowry up in New Richmond that was, you know, we don't want something like that, but what buildings could be repurposed that could be low-income housing versus building something brand new? Well, that's um, what I keep thinking about what are empty buildings that are, it can be turned into temporary shelters. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I don't know. Yeah. Bob, and is there, is there zoning challenges with that? Absolutely. Um, there's zoning challenges um, depending on the municipality. And there is a lot of not in my backyard challenges um, to even having low income housing. And what people really realize is that um, except for a few areas in our counties, in our, in our areas, we all live together anyway. You know, like, it's your neighbor that's low income and is struggling, right? It's, you know, we don't really have, I mean, in Hudson, I suppose there's a couple areas that are definitely, you know, um, upper um, middle class neighborhoods that there's not going to be low income housing around, but there, there's plenty of room for everybody. And, and these are people, you know, I mean, we're all in this boat together. We need to have um, teachers and nurses and doctors and engineers, and we need to have people that pick up our garbage and we need to have people when we can go back to restaurants and feel safe doing so, <laughs> we need people to serve us and cook for us. And, so we need to find ways that it's equitable and I'm not saying, you know, obviously everybody's not going to have the same thing, but people should be able to work and pay for the housing and food for themselves and their families. 
Anyone else have a comment or um, question? Okay, seeing none, Robin, thank you very much for taking your time and being with us. We uh, we appreciate it, and please pass on to everyone out of West Cap our uh, best wishes for a Merry Christmas, and everybody stay safe out there. Yeah, you too. Thanks, Dave. And you all have my um, contact information, so please feel free to email me anytime. Happy to um, try and help or answer questions whenever. Very good. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we'll move on to item number three, COVID response around mental health in St. Croix County. Bob? Uh, thank you, Chair. I invited Char Lopez, our behavioral health administrator, to do a presentation on our behavioral health division with a, through the specific lens of looking at COVID-19 and the impact that's having on behavioral health services. So Char has been with us now going on two months. Um, if there are questions you have after her presentation, her and I both agreed that we would answer them if we didn't know uh, at this moment. But I'll turn it over to Char. Um, she's done this presentation already or a similar one for the ADRC. And um, I, think it cap I think it captures what the board was looking for in terms of uh, what is the impact of COVID-19 on our behavioral health uh, division, specifically with respect to emergency services, mental health, and addiction. So I'll turn it over to you, Shar, if you're ready, and um, let you uh, explain this, the slides, please. Absolutely. Thank you. Um, first, before I go on, I just want, I want to extend a thank you to uh, Supervisor Paulet Anderson for extending the uh, National Association of Counties Professional Development Academy scholarship to um, the supervisors and managers um, in health and human services. I was actually able to complete my onboarding today and um, I will begin my leadership. There's over 8,800 county um, staff that are participating in this cohort, which is um, a, a ginormous amount. So I will definitely share the things that I learned um, with the committee in post late spring when I, when I get uh, an opportunity to uh, apply some of it. So just talking, just looking at behavioral health, and, and many of you are, are well aware of this, but I just want to kind of give a, an overview of what um, services that are actually encompassed under behavioral health. So there's several areas, and each program has an area of specialty. And so what we're going to look at is mental health, which is the just the general ongoing uh, mental health therapy and services um, that, that you would expect mental health would be. Um, we also have the adult community support services, and that includes the community support program, that CSP program that you hear about, and targeted case management. And they are providing services to those um, consumers who suffer from chronic mental illness, both the long and short term. Um, we also have the substance use disorder pr program, um, and there is both voluntary and court-ordered services uh, in both assessment and therapy. We have emergency services that are, provides uh, the point of contact for those experiencing crises in the community. And we also have um, collaboration with Northwest Con Connections and local hospitals on those emergency services that are provided in St. Croix County. Um, and then we also have the adult protective services that provides interventions for adults who either seek or are referred for intervention and services. And this area um, provides avenues for both guardianship, protective placement, as well as investigation for those uh, vulnerable adults. And just, I think things are gonna, listening to Robin's report, I think things may look drastically different after the first of the year, um, because many of our, our uh, concerns really are uh, hand in hand with what Robin was talking with. Um, but currently, and this is just a snapshot, and this may look very different in March, um, but we currently are seeing that mental health caseloads have remained fairly consistent and, and haven't really fluctuated a lot since the pandemic start in March. Um, it should be noted that all therapists, um, most, most all behavioral health staff are working teletherapy currently, but there are some areas that that just isn't possible, but most of them are. Um, 
the therapists have I think maybe anecdotally talked about uh, you know, they have had more frequent contacts with their consumers, but for shorter sessions, for me, so maybe more more frequent check ins. Um, and, and initially, there was some reluctance from consumers to really engage in that teletherapy. Um, <clears throat> there was a, a lag time between the time that staff went uh, and worked from home and everything was set up to go. And some consumers were just going to wait it out. And they thought, well, I'll just wait till we're back in, in, um, in, per in person. Um, and then as it kind of started to progress, actually some co consumers have really reported some greater satisfaction with teletherapy than in-person therapy. Um, they found with some maybe um, clients that have hard of, that have hard of hearing, the communication is much is actually easier and more clear. They're not necessarily relying on reading lips. They can um, they can have things dictated out when when the talk to text. So some of that has actually been um, in, uh, increased programming and services for some of our clients. There's also been some discussion about you know doing some trauma um, therapy in a setting that where you're more comfortable. Is, it could be more successful and where maybe you can have your, your animal or your therapy animal with you. Um, so there's actually um, clients and, and consumers that have, have really kind of decided that this is something that, that they actually like. Um, so looking at the working with the chronically mentally ill, again, not, not a notable increase in the inpatient mental health hospitalizations. Um, or other supportive program placements, the caseloads have main, have really maintained um, pretty consistent. And looking at this slide, uh, this information was through the end of November. Sure, I think we lost your voice. Uh, Mr. Chair, it looks like she's frozen there on uh, Zoom. Uh, let me see if I can contact her. Mr. Chair, until we get her back, uh, would you like to move on to financials or wait a, a minute for that? Yeah, let's go on and uh, we'll do the financials while we're waiting. Okay. Okay. Um, good evening. So the financials are, I'm face drinky for those of you who don't know, know me. Um, the financials were included in your board packet. Um, Ken or Adam, will you be bringing them up, or should I just go with what I have in my notes? Yeah, either do a share screen or just review what you have for notes. Oh, I don't have them on my screen. I always print paper. You know me. Just um, hold the paper up to the screen then. <laughs> Here you go. <laughs> um. So I just wanted to say, you know, we're kind of getting close to the end of our calendar year. Um, the report that's in your packet, you know, shows the expenses and revenues that were either paid or received in November. Um, so next month, during the month of December, you'll get those expenses and revenues for December. Um, but I want to remind you that into January, February, March, we'll continue to post expenses back into December of 2020 and even our revenues will come in, you know, all the way up until May that we will post them back into December of 2020. Um, you know, we really don't get our finalized numbers until the audit is completed, you know, which happens in the middle of the summer. 
A um, couple of items to bring to your attention. Um, on our public health, we did talk about, you know, the extra staff that we have on there. So you'll see um, the salaries and fringes are um, close to the budget amount and will probably go over next month. But we do have extra revenue that we receive to help cover those expenses. Um, some of the money that we got was routes to recovery, so extra COVID specific expenses, you know, protective equipment that pre-PE protective personal equipment we bought or items that we purchased to help the staff work remotely, we were able to cover with some of the um, routes to recovery money. Um, children's services, I've talked about that kind of previous months too. We are over budget in our purchase services. Um, we do have a couple of very expensive placements. Um, I know children's services are working hard, you know, to manage those placements and um, do what they can to get children back home. Um, when we get to the health center campus, you'll notice this month that the depreciation for 2020 was posted. You know, so that was, I think, $493,000. Um, it does show then that the campus as a whole has a negative balance. Um, we don't really count depreciation, you know, with some of our cash part as far as the cash flow of the nursing home, but it does um, reflect in the financials. We are expecting additional CARES funding to come in. We have some Wisconsin CAP money that will come for Orchard View and Kitty Roads. And then there's both... Um, an admission incentive and some infection control incentive money that the nursing home will get as well. Any questions for me on the financials? Not seeing any, you, uh, you did a good job tonight, young lady. Thank you, Dave. You bet, thank you. And Char, you are back, so I'll get you on. You're still smiling, that's the good thing. I was just trying to demonstrate the, the challenges with doing teletherapy that, that clients and or staff may experience. <laughs> oh, I'd like to say my kids are on the internet doing their homework, but okay. Um, so I just, just talking about the substance abuse, um, how the numbers are actually down a little bit, but, but that is a little bit it doesn't really paint the picture. If you look at kind of where we're at, where um, I, last summer in 2019, August of 2019, we were about on our intoxicated driver program, we had a waiting list um, of about 60 that had to wait about 60 days. And the end of November, we were at 10 waiting about a week and a half. So um, even, even though the numbers are down, what it's, we've been able to do regardless of COVID is really catch up on some of that and getting consumers in quick on quicker, um, quicker await. So they're not waiting so long. And this just gives a, like shows you a um, graphic of what that is. And really, um, like I said, they're, they're, the staff are working really hard to try to make sure that whoever needs to be seen, especially in the substance use um, is, is getting in there quickly. Um, there, I just talked with Kristen Debry, and it, actually it was 27 at the end of, of November, but at um, December 15th, we were at 23 on the waiting list. Um, but it really should be noted that there is a lot of triage and priority services that go into that. So not, not so anyone who has an assessment and is then waiting for, um, they qualify, or for or or should be in outpatient treatment. They're all 27 of those or 23 are giving options to go to other places um, to to receive their uh, DOT approved services or, or treatment, so they can be um, the court would be be satisfied by the court. Um, those who are triaged, who are not putting on put on the waiting list, include those who are involved in treatment court. Anybody who um, is justice involved that is referred for the matrix programming, um, 
both mothers and fathers that are involved in children's services, pregnant mothers, um, those with histories of IV drug use, and consumers with just that come out with high need level of care, they're also given um, priority. So many of those on the waiting list are currently okay with waiting um, and are given options if they, they need to uh, or want to do their treatment um, quicker. Um, so here is where we're really seeing uh, an, an increase, and this is really going to go hand in hand with what uh, Robin was reporting. So the area that we see increase is definitely in crisis contacts, and it isn't so much that there's more of them, it's that they're more complex. There's definitely, and anyone who has a teenager at home that's trying to you know, learn on school at school who hasn't seen their friends um, can probably really relate to um, adolescents and crises. Uh, it, it it's it's so widespread and and it is definitely COVID related. Um, so the other things that we're seeing are way more jobless, uh, job loss, inadequate or no housing, and just general isolation. And in addition, some many of these are, are co-occurring, which meaning that we have both substance abuse concerns and mental health concerns going on at the same time. Another area that we're seeing more referrals is definitely in the adult protective services. Again, there are much more complex concerns, um, definitely COVID related and increase in financial exploitation. Um, there's a lot more demands for emergency protective placements. And of course, as we heard from Sandy, they weren't taking uh, placements. So you, you run into the kind of a log jam of trying to find where these protective placements um, may be. And then more referrals for the legal guardianship. And, and there is definitely a c continued concern for the coming months for adult protective services. So kind of where we... we um, this is what I was just uh, <laughs> giving some barriers, uh, examples, but lack of technology. So uh, before March, I'm sure n none of us, I don't, I, I don't know that I ever used Zoom before or Teams before, um, but we had to quickly learn to be able to just function in our jobs. Um, many don't have computers or smartphones or tablets or reliable internet or Wi-Fi um, to even access the services. Um, there's some general dis distrust or just even discomfort in utilizing teletherapy with, um, you know, therapists being in their own home and um, just feeling like maybe that isn't right for me with, with the clients. And then some, so we need a lot of the paperwork we need for our licensing. It needs to be signed. Um, and it needs to be signed before they start. And so we run into some issues with if we were in clinic, we would just slide a piece of paper to them. And now we have to figure out how to get it signed either digitally or get it to them to get it signed and, and brought back. Some people just prefer in-person services. Um, some only have phone to use as their primary service, which is okay, but it's not the same. Um, and then this is really, again, what, what was Robin was saying, there is competition for community resources um, that have already been, been flooded and for the housing, the employment, and the nursing home beds. Some of the things that we're trying to do and see really as opportunities is, you know, COVID has really forced us all to think um, differently and provide services differently. And so we're looking to do some teaming across uh, departments within Health and Human Services. Um, just for an example, uh, uh, substance use disorder programming and children's services are working together to make sure that um, not just the mothers, which is part of, of our, our credentialing, but also that the fathers too are given priority services. Um, that public health and um, Adult protection are actually have very recently teamed. So if you have a concern where you have an adult, vulnerable adult living in um, a situation that 
may or may not be hazardous to their health, you have, it, there isn't a lag time. You have the protective services staff going in, and if there's a concern, public health will, will be um, there to follow very quickly to uh, assist, help and assist and assess what it, it needs to happen. Um, and then we also have opportunities to seek uh, partnerships with some of the justice involved consumers. Um, that was kind of my wheelhouse and I am I, I'm actually pretty excited about some of the programming that is going on in St. Croix County. I actually got to be part of treatment court this morning, which was actually pretty fascinating to see how um, that interaction and kind of the relationships that are built within the courts. Um, so we're looking to just to, to make sure that we can we can make that as seamless as possible going from the justice system to um, community-based services. Um, they actually do a really good job already, but just looking to see if there's some other things that we can do. And then providing some tra tra uh, training or informational sharing with community stakeholders. I know that um, Kristen Newton had talked with uh, maybe going to Grace's, Grace Place and doing some mental health um, first aid with their staff. So as we continue to look at services to provide and explore whether there are more efficient or more consumer friendly methods to provide service, um, it's, COVID's really forced us to think, feel, and act differently. So we want to capitalize on what are the things we found that are actually useful. Like I talked about some of those clients that really do better in with teletherapy. Um, and see if we can expand that within, you know, with our consumers within our licensing guidelines. So what questions do you have for me? And if I can't answer it, I certainly will get back to you very quickly with an answer. I think I asked this when we had this when I saw your presentation previously and you demonstrated it with the, the, <laughs> the technology barriers. And also um, I would think that if you haven't started with a, it's one thing to have a counselor and go to telehealth with that same counselor than it is to meet someone new um, in mm -hmm. that environment. So mm -hmm. I imagine that's the mix of people's feelings on that. Yeah, there's there's been both, yes, because with the new intakes and having this be a new thing you've never done before and having to establish that relationship via Zoom is challenging. Any other comments, questions? Well, I, Bob, just, I think one of the things like... that, that you and I had talked about every once in a while was, uh, as a matter of fact, our last conversation was we were uh, – we were very uh, blessed to have uh, Shar come on board uh, when, when she did, and it's uh, she and her staff do a tremendous job, and uh, it shows again that our, our great folks in, in uh, public health and uh, health and human services, St. Croix County is very, very blessed with some very dedicated uh, county employees, and thank I'm you, Shar, and your staff. Thank you. I'm very, I'm lucky to be here, and I, I really appreciate the opportunity. Any other comments? Uh, just to add, Mr. Chair, just to add to, to the conversation briefly, um, I think what Char helps bring to uh, the Behavioral Health Division, and something that already existed there, but I think she will help um, highlight it, is that we look at health from a whole person perspective. In other words, the things we've talked about tonight, homelessness and economic hardship, uh, addiction and mental health and emergency kinds of needs are all connected. And um, what we try to look at is not uh, health conditions by diagnosis or health conditions by population, but to look at health as connected and how we can better as a department uh, integrate our divisions to look at health that way so that when we talk about homelessness or addiction or mental health, we connect the dots there and say these are all these barriers or these distinctions between populations are really, really artificial. They're what our system created. And we're trying to look at how we can work through interdivisional kinds of uh, efforts to bring all of our divisions together and look at health holistically and how do each how does each division contribute 
uh, to the health of the individual in that particular area without looking at it uh, in a silo. Um, I think Char brings a perspective uh, uh, that helps to build on that concept, and I, I just want to commend her for that and thank her for coming tonight um, to present this uh, information. Thank you, Char. Thank you. Anyone else have a comment? Okay, and Char again, thank you. Um, you folks have been very patient. Uh, we're coming down to the end. Um, are there any requests for future agenda items? Well, I'd like to keep housing and uh, uh, on the agenda and what we can do as a county. Okay. Anyone else? Were you going to explain the listening session, or is that another agenda item that's to come? I'll be talking about that in a couple minutes. All right, let's move on to announcements and correspondence. Bob, do you have anything to start with? I have one announcement, Mr. Chair, I'd like to make, and it's just a, a pat on the back to Julie Krings and the Children's Services Division. Uh, they received a targeted safety support, a support funds grant. Uh, this this grant money, and it's a little over $100,000, a little more than what we were anticipating, but these funds would be used, uh, in my uh, layman's terms, would be used to help support families and kids uh, in situations where the, the child or children were at risk of being uh, a, a placed in an out-of-home environment. So these kinds of dollars could be used in a flexible way to support the families and support the child uh, to keep them in the home and keep the family together. So that was a nice um, that was a nice bit of news that we received this week, and I wanted to pass that along. Thank you. That's great news to hear. Adam, have you got anything? Oh, sorry, I just had to unmute there. Uh, we are currently working toward a newsletter. Uh, I believe I mentioned it in the ADRC meeting, uh, the last one. Uh, so the newsletter, I'm working with public health, and we're looking at about maybe mid-January for that to be released. Uh, it will be both a print and digital newsletter. So that's one of the bigger updates for, from communications. Other than that, uh, we're just working on updating the website with uh, the new dashboard. That's the, the big new piece. And then uh, information around vaccines coming up. And that's it. Okay, thank you. Mr. Umchum, uh, county administrator, but not for long. Uh, Ken, have you got any Anything you'd like to uh, talk about? No, other than the thing you're going to talk about, no. Yeah, you're doing a good job pushing on me, aren't you? Yep. Okay. Uh, I, I will let the board know. Uh, we've been in touch with a, uh, a group of uh, uh, citizens uh, who had uh, talked to a few of us about a task force or a possible task force on some different ideas that they had had. Uh, I made a recommendation uh, not to move forward with that. I'll let this board know that. Um, and after uh, Ken and I and uh, Scott Cox um, had talked about some things, I decided to uh, to uh, throw out the idea to this group of a, uh, a listening session. Um, and what it would be is, uh, well, I'll just read part of this. As a group of citizens has requested the chance to share their alternative perspectives on living with COVID-19. The views and ideas do not reflect those of the county board staff or any of our elected officials, but represent a voice from members of our community. So I've decided to, uh, to chair a listening session on uh, Wednesday, November 30th from 6 to uh, 8 p.m. It will be at Zoom. Um, the board is invited. If you'd like to listen in, you may do so. It is not required. This will not be a county board function. It will not be a county committee function. 
strictly a listening session. Uh, it will be recorded. Uh, so folks, if you want to listen to it later, you can do that. Uh, there will be no public comment taken. Uh, there will be no uh, questions and answers uh, like we did in a town hall. Uh, but there will be some speakers. There will be a nutritionist. Uh, we'll talk about uh, healthy eating and building the immunity. A chiropractor talking on alternative treatment. A pastor speaking on spiritual well-being. A medical doctor's perspective from an MD's side of the view. Uh, lifestyle coach with alternative choices, and finally a mental health professional on uh, the effects on folks. Uh, and we will, uh, we're going to leave it go with that. And like I said, this is not a county board function, nor is it a com county committee function at all. Strictly I, a listening session. I have a question, Dave, just to be honest, to, to say, that might be true of what you're saying, but we're using county resources to have this listening session and it may be perceived as a county um, as the opinions of the county. So I want it to be very clear that that's not the case. Yep, that's a good point, Supervisor Leaf. Um, I do commend uh, the chairperson for, um, you know, taking the time out of his schedule to uh, listen to some alternative ideas and try to find areas where we do have common ground. Um, I know a lot of the issues seem very divided, uh, but I think if both sides can listen to each other, uh, they can maybe find where some of that, uh, it overlaps and there is common ground between us. Um, and so I think uh, the chair is, is taking a step in that direction to try to identify some of that common ground. We are using, you know, our Zoom resources, which, you know, other than the electricity cost and I guess doesn't have a huge expense for the county, um, but they are citizens of the county that are coming forward and, and really wanting to be heard. So I thought it was a, a good investment for uh, the amount of resources we are putting into it. And as um, uh, the chair did explain, there is a disclaimer on there that the views presented there are those of this public group and not of the county. Uh, but what we are looking for is that common area. Okay, that's fine. I'm wondering about the, um, other, I mean, I know we have our HHS committee, but are there other, when you say this this other group, I'm also wondering about others in our own community, not the HHS board, but other practitioners, other um, specialists in the science side that could also do another, you know, maybe this is a series, right? You have this and then you have a group of other folks for to balance out. Yep, absolutely, and I don't think uh, we're ruling anything out. Um, and we do frequently bring in um, speakers, uh, like we had Wes Cap in uh, this evening to to speak about a particular subject. So it is not uncommon that we do um, bring people in uh, to speak. There's a group of citizens that felt their viewpoints weren't getting represented in any of those comments that were brought forward. Uh, so they organized and and asked for this, and and the chairs agreed to listen to them to to see if there is anything. Um, where we do cross over and, and have agreement and, and can maybe promote some of those areas that uh, where there is agreement. Two quick things. First off, uh, Dave, could you clarify the date? Because I believe you said November 30th, and that would be um, a long time away. <laughs> December 30th. December 30th. Okay, thank you. I think the second thing is is my question is that um, hopefully the information we presented will have um, some background and, and some um, validity to it. I don't think it needs to be, you know, the, the level of scientific information I might necessarily want. Um, what I'm really concerned about is more misinformation and um, information which has been pretty well established to be um, contrary to the best interests of, of the community and the citizens. Um, and so is there a mechanism so that if Clear misinformation is conveyed in the course of this um, conversation that there would be some type of um, county response to that. Yeah, we don't have a, a fact check methodology uh, established. So uh, I, don't, I don't have a good answer for you on that. Sorry, Dr. McGinnis. Well, I'm hoping that doesn't happen and I'm really hoping that this group will, will um, work hard on that piece of the, of the puzzle. 
um, cause I think that would be, would be a value to the county. A lot of misinformation, um, would not help us at all. Um, and just create more confusion, distrust and, and, and problems within the, within the county. Oh, go ahead, well, I, I agree. I have some concerns about it. I guess, I mean, I'm, one of the questions I have is, um, is this open, this is going to be open like to the public? Is it going to be advertised? I wasn't really clear about that. And then, I mean, we're at a point in this pandemic where vaccines are coming out and we're trying to get people vaccinated. And I'm just afraid that, um, you know, there's already some concern about um, the number of people that will be vaccinated, that th this, you know, could be a setback kind of thing. So, it, it does, just to be honest, it concerns me a little bit. Yeah. Mr. Chairman, this topic is not an agenda item, and it is now into, well, into discussion, which is a violation of open, open meetings. Point well taken, Scotty. Ken, did you have a comment? Well, not now. All right, I think with that, our next meeting is going to be January 20th at 5 p.m. Uh, it will be another Zoom meeting. And uh, with that, uh, I, uh, to each and every one of the board members that are here and to uh, staff, uh, I'd like to send warm wishes to each and every one of you and yours for a very uh, warm and uh, blessed holiday season and uh, please be safe out there. Our meeting is adjourned.